I want to welcome everyone for coming to today's talk about how to build effective relationships with developers. Today I have with me Agile leader Christine Romero. So excited that you're here with us today. And I want to say, oh my God, thank you. And I want to say too, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this event, we really wanted to focus right now with everyone working from home, working remotely for QA teams. It's now more important than ever, and I know that's a cliche, but it's now more important than ever that we find effective ways for building relationships with our developer teams. And it's also important too that we start thinking now more than ever about what is the global mindset, right? And how do we get into it? And Christine's gonna offer some concrete examples about what the global mindset is and how we can apply that to our teams. And specifically, we're also gonna talk about working to build an inclusive and diverse global team. With that said, I wanna real fast introduce someone who I admire so much, not only as a leader, not only as a mentor, but also as a personal friend. Um, Christine has been an Agile leader. Um, currently, she's at Sauce Labs, but she's been an Agile leader for over 20 years of working, having experience working with developers directly at companies such as Charles Schwab and has over a decade of experience in Scrum. And what I love about you, Christine, is I love how passionate you are about building effective communication strategies. I love, love, love how you get into product road mapping and implementation, and you really have a knack also for bringing out the best in your global dev teams that you run at Sauce. Um, Christine is also a member of the Coordinating Committee for the Agile Enterprise. It's an organization based in San Francisco, and she's also a Bay Area local. How did I do, Christine? You did great. <laughs> no, wow. thank you for inviting me. This is, this is good stuff. I'm, I'm really excited about this conversation. I think it's Go good. Ahead. Good. And one person on a personal note too, for everyone in the audience, I'll say one of the things that I also really admire about Christine is, you know, her own personal story. And she agreed to let me just share very briefly that, you know, being a single mom and, you know, raising her child and working her way up in leadership at companies like Charles Schwab and always just your level of positivity and enthusiasm and, um, pragmatism, I think it's second to none. So I really, really appreciate you. And I appreciate you taking time today and everyone in the audience. With that said though, Christine. Thank you. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we could do this all day, but we have an audience, so you know. I wanna just dive in a little bit and I wanna talk. Can you let our audience know, because everyone defines Agile differently, can you briefly let us know how you define Agile? Yeah, so Agile in the sense is, is a mindset, right? Everyone looks at the mindset and I think some people are familiar with the whole manifesto but it's based on like four different principles and it's really the way that we work right so it's been adopted in the software development life cycle a lot heavily in the technology industry um, it's it's also being adopted within uh, human resources people ops construction is also adopting it there's a variety of industries that are now really interested in it and one of the main reasons why is because we really value working in a very collaborative manner. It's all about collaboration. It's about a lot of communication. It's about delivering value to the customer, whoever your customer may be. It's really about delivering that value to the customer and coming together in order to deliver the value to the customer. Um, you know, once upon a time we had Waterfall, which some companies do use Waterfall, they use Scrumfall, but in the past, there was a lot of project management and what we now call PM driven requirements and they would come to the developers really late in the game and the developers didn't have the ability to actually talk to the customers. Agile actually started breaking down some of those walls and allowing the dev teams, the QA teams to ask the customers or consumers of the product those questions so that they can get a big picture of what problems and challenges are, are they trying to solve for the customer? Because I think at the end of the day, that's what a lot of teams want to know is, we're building something, but what are we trying to solve, right? What does this do for our customer? Um, so in, in the way I look at Agile, it's just the mindset of how you adopt things, right? Things might be constantly changing in the industry and you have to be able to adjust to those changes in the industry and Agile allows for that. I love that response. And we are gonna talk a little bit more about some concrete examples that you all can implement in this conversation, but I think 
I think that was an amazing definition, by the way. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And so diving in a little bit further, right? So let's talk about agility and the relationship between QA and devs. What can agility do for those relationships? Again, you know, it's, it's the mindset and it's the mindset that needs to be, um, how do you say, I, I don't want to use the word adopted, but it's the mindset that the team needs to think in um, both dev, the product owner, the scrum master, um, everyone needs to think in terms of agile, right? And we all need to be speaking the same language. So one of the things that I would say is agile has a set of frameworks, whether it be Kanban, whether it be Scrum, I mean, I think Scrum is the most common one that a lot of people start off with and people are very familiar with that. But again, it, it it's a collaborative working relationship. So within Scrum, we have this thing called backlog refinement. And so what it allows is for QA, dev, product managers, or product owners, and Scrum masters to collaborate in these backlog refinement sessions. So if you're scoping a story out, which could be called a requirement, um, devs and QA are working together to help address or answer the questions, right? They're asking, hey, what is, as a, so that for what? Like, what is the intended outcome of this? What does that acceptance criteria look like? What does it mean if I'm someone working in QA, what do I need to test in order to make this story complete, right? You look at all the different edge cases and you wanna make sure that you're capturing as much as you can so that you know when you go to test a story, you wanna reduce the amount of maybe not, not necessarily bugs, but you wanna make sure that you're capturing the right user experience. So it's a constant communication between everyone as well as asking the devs, hey, how are you building this out? I'm getting ready to build my automated test cases. How are you building this out? And it's, it should be constantly collaborating throughout the entire life of the story as well as the sprint. Mm -hmm. So it really, um, it really lends itself to that mindset where you can work in a very collaborative fashion. I love that. And so diving in a little bit too, Christine, you are working with some of the top companies in the world right now, and you've also had experience for years now. I'm wondering for you, how have you seen companies right now? How have you seen your customers? How have you seen the market changing um, and responding to the changing market right now through Agile? Yeah, so again, you know, Agile lends itself to be able to inspect and adapt to what the market needs are. So again, in the past, you had waterfall and you could easily draft out a plan to say, here's what we're going to um, work on and scoping for the next six months. And here's what we're going to deliver to the customer in three to six months, like a big bang, right? Uh, Agile allows you to deliver customer um, in shorter increments or deliver to the customer in shorter iterations incrementally every two to, it depends on your sprint cycle, every one week, every two weeks, every three weeks. If you're Kanban, it's even, it's even faster, quicker. Um, but it really allows you to work back with marketing and marketing might sense some trends that are going on and they might say, you know what we have scoped out for the next six months is not what's gonna meet the market needs right now or the demands, right? So it allows you that flexibility to adapt to what those market needs are. So mm -hmm. you might have to take a step back from that plan and pivot. And that's okay, right? Because you're responding to change over following a long drawn out plan. I think that's a really important point to make too, because we've talked about this before, you know, companies will make a six month roadmap and then something will completely change. And then with agile, right, you can have quarterly planning, but when the market changes, this offers you that opportunity to take a step back and to pivot. Exactly, which is really nice. Um, I know sometimes uh, people will get into that roadmap planning phase where you're planning out three to six months and sometimes it gets a little uncomfortable responding to that change, but it's nice to keep in mind that what matters is delivering value to the customer. And that's, you know, why a lot of companies are around is because we want to make sure that we're delivering value to that customer. Absolutely. And I also want to make sure that we are continuing to build and deliver value for our customers and the audience watching. And I know that for you and I, we talked a little bit about, you know, you and your experience when you started in Scrum and where it's at now. Can you tell me a little bit about briefly, what is it that you wish you knew now that you've been in Scrum forever, right? 
What do you know now that you wish you knew when you started? I don't mean forever for our audience, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good question. So, um, you know, it's funny because that's, that's actually one of the questions that we ask in our interviews, right? When people have had like two or three years uh, under the belts of, of working in the scrum industry, or agile industry. Um, so I think early on when I learned about scrum and that there's this scrum guide, that scrum guide is good, but it is a guide. And I think that you need to really look and take a step back and say, the guy doesn't have the answers to all the questions. Like people, relationships within a team can be really complex at times. And you really have to take a step back and find out what is it that your team needs, right? They, the guide says you must have a demo. Well, you should have a demo at the end of every sprint, but sometimes that isn't going to be the case, right? Sometimes it might not be for another week out. And you know, you really have to work back with your team to find out what kind of cadence they're interested in having, what they find value in. And, and some of those answers are just not in the Scrum Guide. So for me, I think the biggest takeaway would have been to be patient. And in the very beginning, I would have said, like, I would go to my teams and say, well, it's not in the Scrum Guide. Well, no, it's not. And it's not going to answer that. So you have to be creative and come up with different strategies and different ways to add value to the team as well, right? Because at the end of the day, it's the team. And if something isn't adding value, then what's the point in having that? Um, it's got to add value. And I love that. And I think that's part of what we talked about today. <clears throat> Thinking specifically about today, our main topic, right? Around building more effective relationships. I want to talk to you a little bit more and talk about what are some concrete examples in your experience where uh, what does agile look like what is, how is that being leveraged um well one of the things for us it's part of building relationships so we're a global company and previously also worked in a company that was um located in in the united states as well as mexico well, you have to have that global mindset you need to learn about the people that you're working with right so um some of the things that we adopted in some other teams was if we would have this trivia to learn about each other's culture, to learn about local events. Um, and people got really engaged in that. And you would learn things, people in Mexico would learn things about people in the United States, people in the United States would learn things about Mexico. One of the big things uh, that we started doing too is um, introducing certain holidays, certain celebrations, right? If we were celebrating something in Mexico, we would try to celebrate it here in the States along with our team, like in early um, morning meetings or right after standups. We really try to participate in that and understand what that all meant. Um, so it was really understanding our global team and mindset. And there's so many different ways that you can do it. And, and part of that too um, is that currently I've been working well for the last two years with teams in Europe. And I know when I first started, um, a lot of our meetings in the United States would take place between nine and one o'clock. And if you think about it with Europe's time difference, that's super late for Europe. So showing that you care and meeting them halfway, maybe once a week, we rotate those meetings to seven o'clock in the morning so that they don't have to stay till eight or nine o'clock at night. Right. Um, so as you're working with the global teams, it's, it's collaborative. It's, it's a give and take in the relationship. Um, and that to me was really key in understanding how to work together globally. At the end of the day, we're all one team. We're all trying to work toward a common goal. And I think the better we understand each other and how our dynamics and relationships are and how to best communicate, we'll succeed together. We don't look at people as individuals. We look at each other as a large team. We feel like we succeed that. together. Totally. I love that. No, I, and I think that's something you and I talked about too. Like a global mindset is obviously it's about you know working with people from diverse cultures trying to build a more inclusive team it's also a global mindset right we talked about this it's about it's about making sacrifices you have to Absolutely. be willing to make sacrifices it's not um, agile isn't just magic right it's magical for sure but it's yeah. about making it's about making concrete changes and i think that a global mindset like right i mean it sacrifices absolutely yeah exactly you know there's um, there's times when you're going to wake up at seven o'clock in the morning and take those calls. There's times when they're going to stay late in the evening to take the calls. So it's, mm -hmm. it's making those sacrifices to make sure that you're looking at it as a team.
and not them versus us or us versus them. Exactly. And I think that's one of the things, like I never thought I would say this, but I feel like in this current, you know, quarantine situation, it's changed some things, you know, and I feel like, you know, I was on a call with um, one of our leaders in customer success and she's like, isn't it 6.30 a.m. where you are? And I was like, why, yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. But that's the <laughs> least, that's the very least that you can do if you are in San Francisco and someone is 10 hours ahead, 12 hours ahead. You have to make accommodations. You also mm -hmm. don't have to take care of yourself, right? And you have to say, is this scalable? Can I do this consistently? Um, but it makes the world of a difference in ways, right, that no one would ever imagine. And I think the other important thing too, right, we talked about this before, when is Slack appropriate and when is Zoom appropriate? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But I want to talk a little bit more around um, actually implementing, right, actually implementing Agile. What does that look like for you? And so I feel like we talked about this as well once, um, you know, when everyone talks about like, oh, how was your day? Well, it depends where you are, but how was your day? People go, oh my right. God, the commute, the commute. It's from my time in New York. Everyone loves to complain, right? You want to talk about relationships. People want to talk about heartbreak, right? And so I want to hear though, for our audience, I want to hear about a challenge. I want to hear about a challenge for you because there are going to be challenges at all times. So let's talk about a challenging time. Let's talk about how implementing Agile and its frameworks drove your sprint forward. Full disclosure, we have some people right now on this call who are about to have some launches. So um, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be really helpful for us. So listen, I think that it's always... Um, it's always a challenging at first when you're coming in and assessing an organization to look at where they are in terms of their agile maturity. You walk into some organizations and they might be adopting the frameworks like Scrum and Kanban, but maybe the agile mindset isn't actually there. So you got to work back and coach product. You got to coach the engineers to think in that agility mindset. But I know coming into my current company, when I first started there, we had a combination of teams. Some teams were doing Scrum, but it wasn't true Scrum. It was a combination of I, all kinds of different stuff. So coming into that, it was really introducing people to the frameworks that Scrum is a time box, the whole story pointing techniques, breaking down stories, what it means to have sprint goals. And then as we start to go through the Scrum cycle, and as teams start to mature, you slowly phase them in, over to Kanban, right? So you look at how much thrashing is going on with the teams, how responsive do we need to become. Um, so you look for the best approaches for the team. One of the things that I really loved is one of my teams is what they call like a core services team. And they respond to not only fixing things that align with the roadmap or new features, but they also get a lot of thrashing from other teams who need um, pull request reviews, the system goes down, they need to address urgent bugs. So what we did is we implemented a rotation, right? So a portion of the team stays fully focused. Well, I would say like 90% of the team stays fully focused on what goals we have in order to meet the four to six week roadmap, while the other person stays focused on incoming requests. Um, any kind of escalation issues. It's basically a support rotation. So it was nice because the rest of the team was able to stay fully focused on that. Then we would shift over and cycle into the next sprint or the next week. The person on call would then do all of the support. Uh, we got really positive feedback where uh, most teams in our organization have now adopted that whole um, cycling and part of the framework because it allows people to stay focused and then it allows the other person that is going through the rotation to learn about the different areas of the system. You know, bugs are unique and there's a lot you're gonna learn. There's a lot of research you're gonna do. So it allows to build that very cohesive team with like all sorts of different skill sets. And we've done that with several teams um, in our current company, which has worked out really, really well. Um, it's not always, uh, how do you say, it's not always really easy to introduce that. And that's the one thing I want to remind people about Agile is that you're going to come up with ideas. I think as a Scrum Master and as an Agile leader, it can be very easy for me to stand back and say, no, that's not what the book says. We're doing it wrong. 
but you have to let teams own that, right? Um, they have to have a sense of accountability of, hey, we brought this up. We want to do this to address it. Let's see if it works. And if it does, that's great. We keep moving forward. If it doesn't, then we stop, we inspect, we adapt, and we try something else. Um, but it's all about helping the team figure out what is going to work best for them. I don't want to just impose frameworks and, and the ways of thinking on them. I want them to come up with things so that they own it as well. And I love that. And I, I think that's a, it's a really, really good perspective. I also want to keep in mind too, for our audience that works at a smaller company and doesn't have the same amount of resources, right? Thinking about them a little bit more and thinking about your experience as an agile leader, right? Um, when you're having these meetings, right? Um, and this is something I think is transferable for anyone in the industry, but in your specific, in our specifically, as an agile leader, there's people who they want to add value in these meetings, right? They want to add value in these retrospectives, which I think, and we've talked about this before, is a perfect opportunity to speak up. But some people can't speak up, right? Some people, it's just not, it's not, it's not, it's not what they do, right? They're more of an observer, they're gonna have a side conversation. How do you address that for these teams specifically that do not have, you know, an agile leader like yourself? Well. I think sometimes teams tend to have like what they call the silent leaders. Like there is someone within the team that emerges kind of in that leadership role. And even if you're not officially a leader on like within the team, but you're that uh, silent leader in the background, um, it's you oftentimes can detect in the room who has something really key and important to say. And I think it's good for you to kind of one off that person just be like, Hey, you know, I kind of noticed you wanted to say something, but you hesitated. What are your thoughts? And I think that you can do that kind of, um, you can have those conversations through one-on-one, -on -one, right? It can be casual too. I think one of the things I got in the habit of was going for coffee or going for lunch if I sat with my teammates and just being like, hey, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Um, and then slowly in retrospectives, kind of say, hey, I think you might have you know, what, what are your thoughts on this? And you kind of call on them. And after a while, they'll start to speak up and it takes a little bit of time, but you have to have some patience with that. Um, but I find that oftentimes um, there's a lot of quiet people in the room and they have so much value to add and mm -hmm. their, their thoughts and everything, they, they really, um, it's just, it, they're really valuable. And I think it's something the team can learn from. So always encourage and find ways for folks to speak up. I love that. And I think too, I mean, if, if anyone here is going to, anyone on this audience as well knows that I love Maya Angelou. And I think I have a quote from Maya Angelou for everything. And one of my favorite quotes from her was, don't call people out, call them in. And I think that's something that I think definitely applies here. How do we call people in? Because I know too, from working with teams as well, and I'm sure our audience can agree, is that some of us are vocal, some of us are not. <laughs> There is also, <clears throat> excuse me, there's also, when talking about diversity and talking about inclusion, we all know that there's certain people that feel more privileged to speak up. And we also know that there's people that come from a personality mindset where that's not their, you know, mindset, regardless of, you know, their identity. But I want to talk about something here, too, before we dive into our Q&A in just a little bit. I want to talk about conflict. I want to talk about conflict. Let's talk about conflict. I'm going to say it one more time because this is, I think, what a lot of people in this audience are watching. So you mediate all the time with conflict, right? This is part of this global mindset. You've talked about working for diverse teams all over the world and managing and being, bringing people together. Can you please give our audience some concrete examples for how you help affect change and bring up from conflict? Yeah, so uh, in a previous company I, I worked for, um, there was QA and there was dev. And there was a lot of conflict because devs would love to keep developing work and they would throw it over the wall and QA was trying to catch up at the end of the sprint, right? And they would voice this huge level of frustration because at the end of a sprint, when the team commits to something, they're really excited about wanting to com uh, complete their sprint goals. And so for me, I saw a lot of tension going on and 
I always try to seek to understand where is the conflict coming from? Why is it happening? What steps can we take to reduce that? Uh, so one of the things that we did is we would tell developers, listen, you're super excited to keep developing and we're excited to have you develop. But is there any chance that maybe you have research you can work on while you give QA the opportunity to catch up with things? Is there a way that you can pair with QA? Is there some unit testing you can do? Um, I think that was probably one of the largest conflicts that I had to kind of bridge the gap between the two areas within the team um, in order to build a healthier relationship. And it was really working back with the QA manager as well to get some coaching for the QA, right? Um, and how we can better use our tools. Do, do people need to, do we need to invest in getting people up to speed in automation? Um, do we need to collaborate better with our devs? And if so, what does that look like? So there's a number of different things that we can do, but I always try to seek to understand what's going on and where the conflict is coming from, right? People are not complaining just to complain. There is a frustration that's happening and it definitely needs to be addressed because if we don't address it, you start to see the motivation decline on the team. Um, and that can be, that goes viral sometimes and it can impact the entire team. So you really wanna work hard to nip that quickly and, and come to solutions. That was super, super helpful. And I think too, I wanna to ask you about another, because I, I live, I think conflict breeds better relationships if you manage it effectively and you manage upward too, right? And so I wanna talk a little bit about another example around conflict. And so we're talking a little bit about like, let's just, Let's just throw an idea out there, right? Let's just, no one's ever been in this experience before, Christine, right? Never. Right. <laughs> so you're in the middle of a sprint, right? And a bug comes up out of nowhere from code or something that, um, you know, your team broke in the environment, right? Like months ago. So how do you handle this? And keep in mind too, how do you handle this as a manager of QA and QA, right? Or is not even just as a manager, but also as a lead or as a member, how, how do you communicate? How do you manage? What does that look like? Well, I mean, everybody wants to slay that bug, right? No, no, no one likes bugs. Stomp it out, stomp it out. <laughs> yeah, stomp it out. Um, no, listen, I think that it's important to look at the bug, understand the severity or the impact that it's having, whether it be internal to our internal customers, to understand what the impact is to external customers, how many people is it affecting, um, you know, was the bug something that we leaked out that we just didn't catch in production? And if so, what can we do to make sure that we have better test coverage in the future? Um, I actually, something that's really nice to do is when you're running the retrospectives and you receive a bug in the middle of a sprint cycle or even an iteration, it's actually nice to talk about the bug in the retrospective to find out what produced it um, what did we do to solve it? Like, how long did it take us to solve it? Is it something, is there something that we missed? Is there something we could have done differently to avoid that? Um, but yeah, I think it's important to visit, you know, it's, it's not to say that we're not going to work on the bug and take it in the sprint, because obviously if it's impacting a lot of customers and you are going to have to push things aside and, and, you know, resolve it. But it is really good to look at the, at the code quality. Is it something we missed in the pull request? Um, I think it's, it's really important to examine where those are coming from and what's causing them. I love that too. And I think one thing to add to that as well, I mean, that was very on point. When we're thinking about communication, right? Um, for those of you in the audience that don't know, I always tell everyone I'm a recovering social worker that fell into test automation and community. Um, and, you know, I love it because I love our community. But I think that there are transferable skills there. And one of the things I used to work on with my clients um, who were homeless youth as a clinical case manager is I always said, meet clients where they're at for change. You also need to also speak their language, right? And so try to start putting yourself in the mindset and everyone is different, but start trying to put your mindset in um, what it is that this, this person, right? They're not a developer. That's, that's what they do for work, right? You're not a QA automation engineer. That's what you do for work. You are you, you have a relationship with other people, right? These are our titles, we are people. So what are the relationships looking like? What do people want to speak in, you know? And so when I, when I came into tech, 
I was like, I don't know what a Giphy is. I don't know what Slack is. Like I really had to learn all of these things. But one of the things that I realized is that people communicate differently in passive forms of communication. I always knew that. But when is it appropriate to get on Zoom? When is it not? What is someone's language, right? You know what I mean? And so how do you understand them and their language and their culture and where they're coming from? And how do you build personal relationships when you're so far apart, you can't have the luxury of going to the office and saying, hey, I didn't like that conversation. I want, or I want to have another conversation with you. Now it's on Slack. Now it's on Zoom. So really tailoring, right? Tailoring and, and, and looking inward and saying, what is it that I want to communicate with this person? Because so much of our audience, you know, is a smaller team or maybe they're a global team. You know what I mean? You know, what's interesting is, um, when I first started with my current company, uh, because it was one of the first times that I worked with teams in Europe, and I noticed that there was a different style of communication. And I started doing a lot of research, and I, I finally started asking people that I work with, how, how can we better communicate with each other, right? Um, some people don't like fluff. Some people just want you to get straight to the point. So it's, it's really helpful to understand when you're working in a team, what is people's style of communication? How do they want to be communicated to? Straight to the point, you want some fluff, like how does that look like? And I think that's really important too uh, when you're working with, with global teams. You definitely should take some time and figure out how does that team, our team, how do we want to communicate? That's really I agree. important. I agree. And also too, coming from the South in the US, where I come from, it's yes ma'am and thank you and we have a drawl and we're always asking how you are right i can turn a switch but that's where we come from that's part of our culture and so if you were to come out and you were to say i need this blah blah blah, blah we'd be like excuse me excuse me you know what i mean and san francisco mm -hmm. has a completely different culture when i'm working with you know um my amazing 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 teammates you know who are in tel aviv or in different parts of israel it's a completely different mindset. And I know you and I have had that conversation before. And so I think part of it too, though, is right. Like, and correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, understand their mindset, but also don't compromise your own culture and your own values. Right. You know what I mean? Don't shift yourself. And I know I'm coming from a place of privilege as like a white gay man, but like, don't forget, don't forget that you also have to stand up for yourself and communicate the important elements for you. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, we've <laughs> got to meet somewhere in the middle, but yeah, it's, 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 it's helpful to know how to communicate with folks. And sometimes you have to do more than the middle, right? You have to go extra. <laughs> it doesn't mean you're not- Sometimes, sometimes you got to bring a sweet to, to, um, to your team and yeah, <laughs> break, mm -hmm. break that ice. I want to talk just lastly before we go into Q&A. I want to talk a little bit to right now, so many of our audience is working from home. And, um, you know, and I think this is why, and this is why you and I talked about this, this is why we changed our schedule a little bit. We made this our first talk, right, for our Tustin community is so many people are working from home right now. But I think also so many people are feeling isolated and a little bit more disempowered than usual. I think it's a struggle, right? Because you're managing upward with your QA lead or you're managing upward with your team. You're also as a leader, right? Or a manager in QA, you're trying to effectively communicate with the dev, dev teams and you're, we're in this space. What advice would you give to those people right now watching? Okay. I would say Zoom, but Zoom fatigue is a thing right? <laughs> it is a thing. It is. It's an actual thing, right? Um, no, listen, I think that it's important to be honest. I think it's important to voice your concerns. Um, one of the things that we do is we do uh, three days Zoom stand-ups, dailies, and then the other two we'll do via Slack, like in the middle of the week and then on a Friday, right? So that people don't have to spend time drained in meetings and they can just send their their stand-ups um, and have the rest of their Fridays. So we really encourage communication. If you need to spin up a Zoom, definitely, by all means. Um, but one of the things that I like to encourage is as we're going through the dailies, I think it's good to say, hey, are we okay? Like, are we still on track? Do we still feel good that we're going to complete the work that we 
we said we were gonna complete within the time frame. Um, one of the things that I like to do with my teams when we used to do quarterly planning, or even at the epic level, is you do fist to five, right? So from one to five, um, five being like, wow, we're super not confident we're gonna meet this. Um, three being, eh, sort of, let's have a discussion. And then five being, yeah, we're gonna rock it out of the park. Um, so I think it's really important for somebody to voice that with the team to say, hey, you know, how do we feel about these commitments? Do we have any concerns? If so, what do those concerns look like? But I think it, it's very helpful at the end of your dailies to check in with the team and just say, hey, everything good? Like, are we still good? Does anyone need to pair? Um, again, it's, it's, it's going back to that global mindset. It's looking at the team as a whole. What's going on with the team? Is everything working well? Is it not? Um, one of the things I tell my team is retrospectives are great to surface what might be going on and what we might need to improve on, but don't be afraid to surface that right after a daily. Like it's better to address it quickly than to sometimes wait all the way out into a full week or two to address it. Um, mm -hmm. Chances are other people on the team are probably feeling the same. So let's take care of it. I agree. I totally like you just you're the best and we're gonna open up for questions in just a little bit. I will say one of the things I always tell people too, is I say, listen, I build cases for empathy for other people every day, every interaction. And I just don't, I don't just do that so I can understand where they're coming from. I also do that. So I don't, I'm not going to say murder because that's very, very strong, but I'm saying <laughs> So I can balance my own anxiety and my own wanting, you know, my own, my own issues. But I will say the one thing that's important too is leverage technology. We're in an, despite being in lockdown, we have so many more tools to us. Can you imagine this happened 20 years ago? I mean, a hundred, I can understand. But <laughs> so imagine like right now, like the technology that you have, people are in different, you know, um, parts of the world. One of the things I can say personally for me in terms of building more effective relationships is I've, I've thought about what do I need to type? What can be communicated via video? Because, you know, as a former social worker, having that non-verbal um, language was so important. So if I'm slacking something to you at 2 a.m. your time and you're just like, are you serious? This is something I've done. I've taken videos. So I've started sending videos to my global teams. It's short, it's sweet, it's two minutes. People don't want to read all that and I don't want to type it. So I literally make a video and I send it to them. And that's that. And it's two minutes max and I put it on Slack and that's it. Build a relationship using the technology and the medium that you have. You don't have to always jump on a Zoom call, right? And I want to say before we jump in, I just also want to say that, you know, for Christine and I, we talked about this we really wanted to have this session so we could open up for Q&A, but we also want to have this session for all of you out there right now that are working remotely and maybe feeling a little bit more disempowered or isolated, or also looking for concrete examples for how you can make effective change happen with your development teams. And thinking about that in a global mindset, we're also trying to build a diverse and inclusive team. No, no big deal, right? No big deal. <laughs> no, not at all. Before we dive into Q&A, I want to just real fast ask if there's anything else that you'd like to add for a global audience. I would say that, uh, you know, a lot of this takes patience and, you know, as teams, definitely they'll get through it. Um, don't be afraid to voice your concerns. I, I think that especially in today's world, there's so much going on. There's... Um, combination of different emotions and those are you know some of those are playing into how we feel every day and I would say that we have to have some empathy and I think that we also need to understand where the people we work with are coming from as well and what they're going through and what they're feeling um, I feel like those things really help build stronger relationships within teams and you know it doesn't hurt to check up on people um, I have people that are not even any longer with the company but we had a very good cohesive team and we've built relationships out of that and we check on them every now and then. Hey, how's it going? You know, everyone doing good. Um, and we'll, we'll do zoom happy hours, uh, just to keep in contact. And it's okay to do that with your team members as well. Um, it just helps keep us engaged and understand what's going on with each and every one of us. I love that. And I really appreciate you taking time and I hope, 
that everyone leaves today's session. We still have Q&A after, but this is a recording, so stick around, everyone on the audience. I hope that everyone who leaves from today's video comes out with more questions actually than you had answers because that means you're curious and we hope that you come from a place of curiosity to build more effective relationships and to have a more empathic leadership style. And so I hope we continue these conversations and for everyone watching as well, we're gonna be having more of these events in our Testum community. You can sign up, find out more at Testum. Um, and we're going to continue these conversations as well. And so I just wanted to say before we go into questions, Christine, you're incredible and you've offered yeah, so much you. insight. So thank you for that. Thank With you for that, having me. Oh my gosh, thank you. Bye everyone, but we're going to pause. Hi. <laughs> All right, let's dive into some Q&A over here. Let's get to the juice here. Let's get to the real stuff over here. So everyone, if you want to go ahead and um, if you have a camera or if you want to ask questions, let's go ahead and meet yourselves. Let's go ahead and ask Christine. What is it you want to know? I see Manuka. Yeah. Hi. So I just want to say it's not a question, but just want to tell that it was very good. I can relate myself to everything what Christine said. And I completely agree with Christine that we have to make a use of technology. That's how we, like, you know, me and Jessica, this is, we used to have stand up like three times a week, but once we, big uh, pandemic hit, we went to uh, four, five times a week now. We can get connected more to the team. So I completely agree that even though we are working remote, if we make good use of technology, uh, we can definitely stay connected with the team. And it's like, uh, you know, be on Slack, like Slack help us like anything, stay connected. And uh, uh, the point which Christine mentioned, the, you know, issues with that, like how like things happen, it was like, oh my God, she's talking about our scenario. So that was helpful. And, uh, you know, we learn as we go, like how to communicate with certain developers. So, I mean, it was helpful. And yes, uh, you know, we can see that you, you, you understand the problem which QA faces in day-to-day -day life with like, you know, communicating with the developers and uh, the suggestions there were useful and i think uh, some of some of it is we are already using it and definitely will will you know um, whatever you guys have suggested will work on that so as of now no questions but thank you guys it was very helpful thank you thank you for that manuka and i want to go yeah. over a second to katcha Thank you very much. It was very interesting and helpful, and I like the idea with the video. Maybe this this way, I will send my long emails uh, from now on, <laughs> and hopefully, yeah, 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 that's a good idea. Uh, I do have a question. Um, um, there is some feeling sometimes that there is a differentiation between uh, developers and QA. It sometimes it feels like there's, you know, some undiscussed unspoken feeling that the QA come to find uh, what developers did uh, wrong or all the bugs that they introduced and mm -hmm. so my question is if maybe you have some tips and tricks how we can uh, um, make you know in the end of the day this is our common goal quality and of our products and we come to help we uh, or manual QA or automation developers we create tools to help everyone to find uh, the issues of our you know common software so how do we reduce this um, you know uh, this feeling which is uh, which creates the, right yeah, Touching atmosphere, yeah, between the you and us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what kind of practices are are the QA and devs following right now? So, is it test driven development? Do the QAs and the devs collaborate through the life of the story, or are the devs? Does it happen where they code and they throw things over the wall? Well, it's complicated. We have a manual QA in Sri Lanka, and I'm the only automation developer in Israel. Uh, the development team uh, is in Israel, and so I'm part of the development team. But sometimes I do feel like there is, a, you know, a Katya's automation failed or Katya's test failed, and I'm like, it's not mine, it's ours. <laughs> and so this is something I would like to change in the mindset. 
Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that we used in a previous company, because we, we had that, and when I keep referring back to a previous company, uh, my current company that I work for, um, the devs do their own QA. <laughs> there's some good and there's some interesting dynamics to that, right? But um, previously, one of the things that we did is we really got the devs and the QAs to collaborate early on in the stories. And I would say that if you're having retrospectives, these are the perfect platforms to uh, raise these um, concerns, right? Um, I'm not, I don't want to say that I'm advocating to have a Scrum Master, but this is where the Scrum Master is, is helpful in the sense that, or whoever can step into that role to say, listen, there's a, a problem surfacing here. Um, how can we work better together? What can we do to, like, from the dev perspective, from the QA perspective, what is it that's causing us to view each other differently instead of as whole, as one team? And what can we do, like, what action items can we take to move toward becoming one team and building into that mindset. I know my previous company, we had a QA, there was people who did the um, manual testing and then we had automated people who worked on automation and it really required us to shift into investing more in automation, automated testing for a number of reasons. I think we know that you know, gives us really good coverage. It's something good to invest in. You're not having to constantly manually test something. So it really took us to a level to invest in that. And I think overall, we were actually able to provide better test coverage. But at the beginning, it was really breaking down the wall and really pushing to work together um, in collaboration. A lot of that started surfacing uh, through the retrospectives and someone actually owning that to say, here's what we're going to work on to improve the relationship. That's good. Thank I don't you. know if that's helpful. Yeah, but definitely take yeah. those action items out of the retrospective and, and go with them and do something with them. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to, before we go to our next, our next, um, our next question, I want to say, Katja. That's a good question. <laughs> I was, I told her, I told her when you're joining before you came, I was like, I want to be friends with her. Like, I want to be friends. <laughs> you're just like the best. Let's be friends. <laughs> so happy to be friends with you. Cool. Um, Ashley, do you have any questions? I actually have two. So um, overall, that was phenomenal. Thank you. I'll, Thank I'll you. say that first. That's really, really good and very encouraging, um, especially having a refresher on on some things like confidence level during stand-ups, but also that's a really, really good idea about three days on Zoom, two days off Zoom for stand-ups. I'm going to recommend that because I know a lot of people on my team would definitely, um, we would all benefit, I think, and enjoy it a lot more. Um, so my first question was, so at my organization, we did actually start adopting that second support team um, that you had mentioned. So we have one full dedicated Scrum team. Um, and then right now it's only a team of one engineer who is who's running that support backlog from mainly customer success or customer escalations. So how, how would you recommend strategy, strategizing um, QA with that team? Um, right now, we're kind of following um, like a sprint schedule where one QA is dedicated fully to the Scrum team and then the other QA member is dedicated to that support um, backlog for two weeks and then we'll switch. And then whatever tickets aren't closed out in that time, just kind of stick with whoever was originally assigned to that ticket. Um, are there any better recommendations though that you could suggest on how to um, better kind of um, get QA placed with the workload, maybe in a smarter, more efficient way? Um, yeah, so that's a really good question. And that's something that I, I've seen um, teams struggle with, right? So we've done a variety of different things, right? So you can have, if you have a dedicated dev working on the bug bashing, we call it bug bashing or escalation rotation, then it's probably good to have a dedicated QA to do that. And if the QA is not finding that they're gonna be like full time working that, then you might wanna split that rotation to where maybe 
50% of their time is spent on working with the team on the backlog items and then the other 50% of the time working with devs. It's always tricky though. Um, so it's something you definitely have to experiment with, but I like to tend more to the side where the QA and the dev are fully dedicated to working on that rotation. And even if the dev is finding, or even if the QA is finding that they're not working on something for quite some time and maybe the other 50% is freed up, they can probably work on building out automation. There's a number of other things that they can do while they're in that rotation if it's not taking up 100% of their time. Yeah, yeah, um, right. Um, I'm the full, so I'm the full automation decade resource. And then um, the other QA resource has been working on building like a, re a written regression plan, which mm -hmm. kind of leading over to a lot of system documentation too. So that's kind of how we've been scheduling. It's good to hear that that's, <laughs> that's a good way to kind of continue then down that path. Um, my second quick question was, so with QA, especially without a manager or a leader title or anything like that, um, we kind of briefly touched on um, kind of managing upwards or um, or horizontally across your peers. So what are your best tips on how to kind of build motivation and build trust back up when there can be um, kind of that breaking in trust throughout the team? Yeah, so one of the things that I always like to, to dig into is what's causing the distrust? Why is there distrust within the team? And I think we need to start there first to find out why, right? what the root of it is. And I think from there, we can create kind of a plan on how we all feel like we can contribute to building up on that relationship. Um, I don't know if you guys are doing retrospect or if you're all doing retrospectives, but I find that retrospectives is a really, really good way to uncover some of those things and build a, a plan to take action by the team where everyone is accountable for improving the way that the team is working. Um, so if you're not having those, I think those are those are really key to helping you build and improve on the relationship. There are going to be times when um, there, oh, there might be an individual on a team that might be causing some of this. And that is always a point where we need to work back with leadership to find out what can be done. You know, maybe the person is ready to move on to something else or another team. Um, there, there could be a number of things that might be going on. So I think it's important to find out what the root of it is, how the team can take full accountability to improving it. And if it is an individual, how can you manage up and work back with the manager to say, hey, is, maybe this is not the right fit. Maybe there's a different team. Maybe this person is interested in another, maybe like, I don't know, open sourcing or something else. So looking for different areas where the person can grow within the company. Maybe it's just outgrown the team. But um. Yeah, I think it's really important to find out what the root of of the friction might be, where the root of the friction may be coming from. And I really appreciate you taking time for this. I also want to be mindful of everyone and their other commitments right now, and yours as well, Christine. I am going to invite you to our community. Exciting. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So. Love to. And I appreciate you for that. So, if anyone on this call has additional questions please contact Christine. She's just the best. She's the best. She's wonderful. She's a mentor. She's a professional. She is someone I call dear to my heart. And she also knows what you're going through. She really does. So with that said, I'm so sorry for everyone else who had questions. Um, quick shout out to Sean. Hi, Sean. Sean's also a fan. So we'll pull you into the, we'll pull you into the community. Sean, you want to say anything real fast before we go? No. Christine said I wasn't allowed to ask questions. <laughs> no, Sean was one of the devs on one of my teams and he was absolutely amazing to work with. Um, you know, one of the things that I would say is that I, I do this, I'm in this role because I truly have a passion for helping uh, teams become just fully dynamic and very comfortable in the way that they work. Um, and it's just something I truly have a passion for. And I love bridging those communication gaps. And you literally had one of your developers, <laughs> you Sean, come on to this call. You know what I mean? Yes. I think that's a testament to you and to your 
um, authenticity in your leadership and your pragmatism. And so we'll continue this conversation on Slack. Um, Christine has a lot going on, so she may not be fully you know, responding right away, but we'll continue this conversation. I just wanted to say thank you everyone for your time. We will have this recording for anyone to watch again. And again, if you have any questions, contact Christine. Christine, you're an angel and I'm sending thank you a Thank you all. This is exciting. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank you.